Hey guys, and welcome back to AP World History. We're in unit number five. We've been taking a look at all of these major political and economic revolutions, uh, spanning from thought processes like the scientific rev to the enlightenment to political revolutions in the Americas and in Europe. Um, and now we're going to take a look at a different kind of revolution and one that's arguably much more important, and that's the Industrial Revolution. In terms of events in human history, uh, maybe only the agricultural revolution during the Neolithic era was more important for humanity in terms of creating systematic change that would drive human beings further and further towards what some might see as their destiny. So let's just go ahead and dive right into this thing. We're going to be taking a look at uh, some of the beginning aspects of the Industrial Revolution. This will take us through uh, the various causes and some of the historical context. And then in subs uh, subs subsequent videos, we will be taking a deeper dive into the effects of the Industrial Revolution. So with no further ado, let's go ahead and hop into our objectives. Take a second, pause on this screen, make sure you have uh, collected these objectives and you will know you are successful at the end of this presentation if you can contextualize the Industrial Revolution, if you can define the term Industrial Revolution, if you can describe the causes of the Industrial Revolution, if you can explain the importance of coal and iron in industrial production, and finally, if you can identify the differences between the cottage industry and industrial production. All right, so go ahead and pause the video right now. And then when done, go ahead and start again. Now, it's been very helpful for us to think about uh, historical events in terms of key concepts and big ideas. So while the objectives will lead you through some of the various content points, let's try to create a conceptual focus to help us map out the Industrial Revolution and how it fits in both to the broader aspects of Unit 5, but also the story of modern human history. So we're going to take a look here today at how environmental factors contributed to industrialization from 1750 to 1900 which in turn led to new technologies that altered economic systems and social structures, right? How do we get from a, uh, a, a standpoint where human beings have been advancing intellectually and politically uh, to uh, create more freedom to arguably where we are in the modern world, which is how the individual might be seen as a cog in the machine of the state apparatus, right? So taking a look at this social hierarchy, we can ask ourselves, is this an accurate representation? Did humanity really lose its way because of the Industrial Revolution? Did all of the promise of the Enlightenment and the political revolutions that precede the Industrial Revolution, did those values get sold out because of capitalism and money? Well, in order to answer a question such as that, we'll have to take a deeper dive look into the Industrial Revolution itself. Now, let's talk contextualization or broader historical context, because the Industrial Revolution didn't just happen. There was a series of events that needed to take place before the Industrial Revolution in order for it to really uh, take hold. Starting in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, we know that Europeans went through a massive um, growth spurt, I think is the best way to describe it. Europe came uh, out of this backwater, not trading, not participating standpoint before the age of um, exploration to tapping into the uh, Indian Ocean trade network, to accessing some of the quote unquote lost knowledge of the classical world that had been stored in the Islamic world. And then Europe became really dominant, specifically in the Western Hemisphere, because of all this new technology and because of a little help from smallpox, right? Now, as the Europeans expanded their worldwide power, whether it was the Portuguese into the IOTN or it's the Spanish and then the French and the English into North and South America, they set up new colonies, right? And these new colonies started to funnel more wealth 
back into the European coffers of the kings of Spain, the kings and queens of England, the king of France, and these European powers were able to utilize all of that money to start to reinvest in their society, send more troops, send more merchant ships out, and really go from a toehold, a really tenuous grip on power in the IOTN and in the new world to becoming the dominant force, right? And these colonial empires start to really harvest a lot of wealth out of their empires. More on that in a second. One of the other things that's really important in understanding the Industrial Revolution, though, is that not only was wealth coming back into Europe, there was also this kind of unintended consequence of trade and exchange, which was the transportation of really calorically rich crops, think potatoes and corn and um, some of those other uh, New World crops specifically, but also crops coming out of Southeast Asia making their way into uh, European farms, where European farmers, despite the fact that they were really hamstrung by uh, rocky and uh, soil that was oftentimes infertile because it had been uh, over um, farmed for uh, generations, despite these poor soil conditions, these new crops thrived. And the thriving of these crops, potatoes and corn in particular, leads to a population explosion. Right. So it's not just that the crops make their way into Europe, the crops do really, really well, which creates more of a food surplus. That food surplus leads to more kids making it into adulthood. Those kids making it into adulthood have families of their own, and those families have uh, kids who make it into adulthood as well. And we see this real broad based population pyramid um, that uh, is going to start to see a really strong representation of both men and women from elderly age, middle age, adolescence, and early childhood, right? So this population explosion is really, really important to understanding the Industrial Revolution. That's a key point, so make sure you have that in your notes. Now, let's hop back over into the economic realm. At the same time that we have all of these dynamic changes taking place in terms of population and demographics and projections of power, we also see the rise of mercantilism, this quasi-capitalistic system that starts to generate some real wealth for European states, but also for European people, especially if you're living in the mother country, if you're living in Europe. And as we will see, one country... England was really hooked up by its mercantile relationship with its colonies, specifically the North American colonies, and was able to utilize that really one-way trade wealth generation system where all the wealth and all the resources are making their way into the mother country of England to start to create new wealth, which then could be uh, reinvested into both trade, but also in the generation of new markets, right? More people especially all these new people who are being born because of this population explosion, have more access to capital. Capital is money. And those people who have more access to money can then start to buy more things. All right. So make sure you got all this stuff down in objective number one. We are moving on to objective two. What is the industrial revolution itself? Well, basically, Industrial production is when you start to utilize machines to replace human labor, right? Those machines are oftentimes going to be much better at producing uh, goods that are of higher quality at a faster rate, which means that over time, you'll have more goods in the market, and that market will be inundated with goods that are also cheaper. So now we start to see how all of those historical contextualization factors can help lead to the industrial revolution. You start to have these changes in technology, owing in large part to advances in science that took place during the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. And those advances in science, mathematics, also start to create more advances in technology, which start to churn out cheaper, better goods, which then could be bought by consumers who are growing in number and have more access to capital because of the colonial relationship, right? So we see this nice, clean relationship between all of the antecedents, all the preceding events leading us into this industrial revolution. 
And the place where the revolution really kicks off is in England. And there's a myriad of factors. We're going to take a look at how capital, colonial markets, raw materials, workers, and the merchant marine all help lead to a much broader industrial process. But before we can even get into that, England had to go through a little bit more reform, um, not political, not economic, not social, but just in terms of farming. So we're going to take a quick look real uh, at the agrarian state of England and how there was some small revolutionary changes that start to occur in the 1600s and 1700s that make Europe, uh, specifically England, a much more viable option for farming. From 1700 until the beginning of the First World War in 1914, a period of great social, political and economic upheaval unfolded across the globe. Every aspect of daily life was transformed in some way. The Industrial Revolution began in Britain during the early part of the 18th century. Prior to this, life in Britain had remained largely unchanged for generations. People lived in agrarian societies. Farming was ruled by the seasons, and the harvest was at the mercy of the sun, rain, and wind. There are many contributing factors that made the Industrial Revolution possible. Too many to cover here. In this program, we will focus on the Agricultural Revolution, the rise of the factory, new technology, and the role of Britain's empire. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be happy with a nickname Turnip. Well, believe it or not, one Englishman, Lord Charles Townsend, was given the nickname Turnip Townsend, and we're about to find out why. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, most people in Britain lived in open field villages. They relied on subsistence farming, which produced enough food for the peasants or tenants of the landowner, but little, if any, extra. Farmers used a system of rotating crops over three fields to grow food. Each year, two of the fields were used to grow crops, barley and wheat, for example, while the third field would lie fallow, left unplanted, to allow the soil to replenish lost nutrients. Livestock would graze in the fallow field, helping to fertilize the soil. In the following year, the crops would be rotated through the fields, one fallow, two productive. Peasant and village households were given a number of strips in the fields to plant their crops. From the 16th century onwards, landowners started turning open fields into enclosed paddocks that were assigned to a single farm. They wanted to bring their land under tighter control and make it more productive. This also meant the peasants were no longer able to strip farm and sometimes could not access water. Now unemployed, most of the peasants had two options work as a hired labourer on a farm or seek employment in town. Some of the larger landowners subdivided the land and then leased it back to the peasants. The way in which crops were sown was improved when, in 1700, Jethro Tull invented a horse-drawn seed drill that could plant three rows of seed at a time. It was able to drill a hole, drop the seeds in and cover them over with soil in one action. Prior to this, seeds would be thrown by hand into the ploughed furrows. Some seed would be eaten by birds and some blew away with the wind. Jethro Tull's seed drill dramatically improved production by increasing crop yields five-fold. In 1730, the Rotherham Triangular Plough, patented by Joseph Foliambi, had an iron blade rather than wood and its design made it lighter and easier to use than earlier ploughs. It required only two horses rather than four, and one ploughman. The Rotherham plough had the dual benefit of cutting labour costs and saving time. And now we come to Turnip Townsend. During the 1730s, Lord Turnip Townsend introduced the Dutch four-crop rotation system to Britain. The four-crop rotation system rotated wheat, turnips, 
barley and cloves, for example, through four fields. The turnips and cloves helped nourish the soil with nutrients which, in turn, would produce a better wheat and barley crop the following year. In winter months, turnips were fed to livestock. This meant that it was no longer necessary for farmers to slaughter their beasts before winter. Improvements in farming had a dramatic social and economic impact in Britain. It now took fewer people to produce more food. By the end of the 18th century, farming had been transformed from primarily satisfying basic food and clothing needs of the village community into a commercial opportunity to sell the increasing food surplus to emerging local and foreign markets. So England has a leg up then uh, in terms of uh, getting started with the industrial process because now we have this burgeoning lower class group of people who need jobs, but also we have more industrialization and commercialization taking place. So you're already starting to see uh, some of the confluence of bringing together of both changes in farming, but also changes in demographic. Now, let's add into that some of the other factors that we talked about before, starting with capital. Well, as I stated in our contextualization piece, there was more capital or money that just existed in society, right? So there's more people with more money who are trying to make money with that money. We call that investment. So now we can start to see the investment in various industries take place in England. At the exact same time, you have more people who are looking to work, right? Those people be could become laborers in, in some sort of new industry, which at this point in time, we really don't have, but we'll see is basically the perfect industry for industrialization. All right. So we have this all this money, all this capital that can be used to reinvest in buildings, machinery, or the extraction of raw materials. Now, let's like add in the fact that there's all these markets existing in England during this time, especially uh, the English colonies in North America, which have not yet broken away. So keep that in mind. The North American colonies, those mercantile markets, are still in play for England. So you know you have more people who need finished goods because all the raw materials have been sent back. You have all this money that could be invested into production. And in England, many of the people who had traditionally been farmers are no longer employed in being farmers, right? So England's colonies give it access to new markets who had sent over lots and lots of raw materials, but were in need of finished goods. All right, so it's another factor that's going to lead to the industrialization of the English economy. Now, speaking of those raw materials, we know that we're getting wood coming over from North America. We're getting cotton coming over from North America and then later from uh, India and the Indian Ocean Trade Network. At the same time, though, England had its own natural resources that are going to be perfect for industrialization. And I'm thinking coal and iron here specifically. So England had this geographic advantage. Its environment had already millennia before England was even thought up as a uh, group of people. We're talking way, way, way back to the very beginning of planet Earth. England was seeded out with iron resources that were easy to extract because they were really close to the surface, right? You're not going to have to mine very deep to get access to tons of iron. Then... Factor in going back to the times of like dinosaurs. Ooh, exciting, right? All of these old forests that had died and then been compressed into layer upon layer, sometimes, you know, hundreds of feet, th feet thick of uh, pure carbon, right? We just call that coal. And so now England has easy to extract iron. It has vast, huge quantities of coal that are easy to extract. That coal is going to be discovered and it's going to become the perfect fuel for industrial machines, right? You got a fuel, you need some sort of energy output um, to build with. Well, you've got the coal. And then if you're going to build big machines that are going to be doing lots and lots of work, wood's not going to cut it. But hey, 
there's iron. All right, now you could take that iron and coal production and start to actually track the industrial revolution, right? So we can actually see as the industrial revolution gets more uh, and more um, uh, energy, really, there's just more and more focus on the industrial process. We start to see the extraction of coal increase from 6 million tons to 12 million tons. Uh, iron extraction goes up 250%. Um, so that by the time we get to the 1800s, the 19th century, we're seeing an extraction of 130 thousand tons of iron and the amount of effort that needs to go into this extraction of these resources is relatively small right which then means people are going to be more willing to invest in some of the new technologies that are going to require the coal and the iron but we're gonna have more on that later on right now lastly you need some sort of workforce but again Due to the fact that we had all of that food coming over uh, into England from the American colonies, and then we had the Enclosure Acts, which kicked most of the farmers off of the farms, there's a ready-made workforce, right? So we see this huge population increase taking place in rural England because more and more of those families are seeing more and more of their kids into adulthood, like I talked about before. And then like we saw in our video, the Enclosure Acts, which was taking an open communal land, fencing it off and making it impossible for farmers to freely access that land, led to uh, a huge migration of workers into cities and those workers need jobs and it just is going to turn out that those workers can get jobs in some of these factories that are being built because we have all this iron and coal and we have a high demand of products and we can pay for all this because we have the capital right so if we just see this perfect confluence all of these different what seem like disparate threads all combining together to make one particular outcome right and then lastly and this cannot be downplayed, right? England had a really massive Navy and what we would call a merchant Marine. It's a fleet of ships that can be used to send products out. If England had simply just created all sorts of new materials, right? If they had flooded their home mother market, there would have been inflation. All the value of the materials would have dropped down. We wouldn't have seen any real trade. People would have gotten what they wanted and the industrial revolution would have just fizzled out inside of England. I, everybody has what they need or poor people can't buy those products. So it doesn't matter that you're making them. The value of those products goes down, 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 down. All the mercantile capitalists who had invested all their money in some of these burgeoning industries would have seen no return on their investment. There would have been probably some sort of economic depression. However, England has the ability to ship all of these new resources and finished products out into its uh, colonial possessions, but also into the Indian Ocean Trade Network. It can trade in places like uh, China um, when China starts to get back in play and in India as well. So England has the ability not just to project power militarily, which we said was one of the key contextual factors for the early parts of the Industrial Revolution, but now England can also project, project its power economically by flooding the world with finished goods that were relatively cheap to make in England, but could fetch a really good price overseas where the ability to make those goods doesn't exist yet, right? Now, everything is set up for this explosion of production. The only thing that's going to be holding England back is the traditional domestic or cottage industry, right? So you might see those terms used interchangeably depending upon a source. The domestic industry or the cottage industry just describes business people who are making some sort of finished good at home, hence cottage industry, cottage being a house. This was the primary means of production of finished goods from the 1600s up into um, the first industrial revolution, right? Workers would depend on the delivery of raw materials, right? Those raw materials would be brought to the house. Somebody in the house would start to synthesize the raw materials into some sort of 
finished good. And then depending on the good, uh, it might be sold uh, to market as is. I'm thinking here like cloth, like cotton cloth, or some uh, form of good uh, that could be then further refined down, right? Think about like a blacksmith and somebody who might be supplying iron, and then that iron could be used to create uh, secondary tools uh, in a secondary uh, market somewhere else. Either way, the vast majority of the work taking place is to being taken place inside of the house and the ability to create lots of materials really, really quickly is not going to uh, exist. So the domestic system, which had worked really well when you didn't have a high demand for goods and you didn't have lots of people who might need some of those goods, no longer is going to be a viable option. The domestic system or the cottage industry could not keep up with demand, right? The lady working at home, spinning cotton thread, and then using that cotton thread to turn it into bolts of cloth is not going to be able to keep up with the demand that is existing inside of the colonial markets and in England during that time, right? So let's kind of review this in song form. You guys ready? Enjoy, especially for you 1990 uh, addicts, right? all you people who love the 90s. Hey, this is a story all about how their lives got flipped, turned upside down. We'd like to take for minutes to explain how it fixed them. Let us introduce the domestic system. In places like England, all the UK, in their cottage is where they spent most of their days, carting and spinning and weaving all cool, making them textiles outside of school. So basically, the domestic system was when all the manufactured products were produced on small scales in individual homes. Through the textile industry, families spent their time in their homes using the three stages, carding, spinning, and weaving with materials such as wool, silk, flax, and cotton. The pros of this system were the following. Families could work at their own speed in their own homes. Work, in, work and living conditions were generally better due to windows allowing air ventilation. Rest could be taken when needed, along with meals. Children had someone watching them, and since everyone would work from the home, family units were usually strong. The products were usually good quality. But a, pro but a couple of problems made conditions no good. Started making trouble in the neighborhood. So conditions seemed pretty great for all the cottage dwellers, but life wasn't all that it seemed. The process was slow, and they lost lots of times in the exchanging of products from one cottage to the next to continue the next step in the process. Not enough product was produced to sustain the ever-growing population of the UK. The new adapted source of water power couldn't reach many of the cottages, and while the families lived in the same environment they worked in, waste around the homes collected quickly. All these people moved in, they got pretty scared. They said, we're moving to the factories and coal mines over there. <laughs> With the increasing population, the cottage system became insufficient and didn't produce a, a sufficient amount of product. This resulted in the shift from working in individual cottages to working in large industrial factories. They gave up the work ethic about century 19. They yelled to the factories, you're harsh and you're mean. But they looked all around them, the factories had fixed them. They produced more than they did in the domestic system. Love that video, right? So just to summarize the cottage industry, the domestic system, it didn't work. Why? Because the market needed more. The market demands more. So what do you do? You take all of those desperate threads, all of the factors that are going to make the industrial revolution possible. You tie them all together and you create new technologies, new modes of production and new paradigms for economics. But in order for us to get into that, we're going to need to take a deeper dive look into the textile industry itself, which was the first industrialized industry in the UK. And we're going to need a lot more understanding of technologies. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Make sure you go back, check out those objectives, that conceptual focus, and make sure you review. Thanks for your time. See you next time. Bye.